humans have been playing games, including board games, for thousands and thousands of years. I know they've done excavations in what's now Iran and Jordan, and they found games that are about 8,000, 9,000 years old. And you know, when you think about like kind of like modern classics today, like Monopoly or Shoots and Ladders, what is it that board games still do for us today? Why have we been playing these for so long? Uh, in terms of those classic games you mentioned, things like Shoots and, and Ladders and Monopoly, they're quite good introductory ways into the, the hobby. They get us accustomed to the idea of sitting at a table together, playing games, introducing some of the, the basic mechanisms that we're accustomed to seeing in some board games. So in some ways, they are a, are a route in to, uh, to the hobby. But I mean, those, those games are obviously old. You know, Shoots and Ladders is possibly well over 2,000 years old in its hmm. earliest form, and Monopoly over 100 years in its earliest form. And, I had know, no clue that Shoots and Ladders was so old, but I guess that just kind of demonstrates yeah. the point that like these same kinds of like, the idea of sitting together and playing something together and engrossed at a table is something that we've been doing for so long. Yeah, you know, we're social animals for the, for the most part. We, we like the interactivity of, of working with people, but you know, there are also games that are all about playing the game on your on your own. They tend to be narrative driven. We like story too. We also like touching things. We like tangible, tactile things. And so board games give us give us that. Um, you know, I understand that you have a background in writing and in history. So I'm curious to know what kind of role does storytelling play in the development of, you know, a board game or a video game of some kind? It would depend on the type of game. So if you're making something like Tetris, you don't really need storytelling mm. there. But uh, there's a lot of it's games. It's just a game of strategy, right? You make the different pieces fit into certain gaps, yeah, and then you eliminate that's, the row. From a, a development perspective, that's asking you to do different things. It's, it's calling on, on different kinds of design skills. It's not really asking for, for storytelling. But we have a lot of games now, uh, both in board games and digital games, that are heavily narrative driven. We have people playing games for the story to spend time with, with characters. It's obviously a massive marketing concern too that you can understand how to how to integrate story with other design elements. And that's you know not uh, necessarily straightforward. If you have a game like Assassin's Creed, for example, a, mm -hmm. a digital game that's uh, using history in some ways, you might have a writing team of over 20 people on that. Oh, wow. And that's not just the... And you have writing credits, right, on, on famous games like Fortnite. And, and so this is kind of interesting because I think when people think of game development, if they're from the outside, at least somebody like myself, I'm not thinking about the writing storytelling aspect, like getting a writing credit on that. So describe that a little bit for us. Like, what does it take then in this team of, say, 20 writers to write a game? What I would say generally is what I think is becoming more clearly understood by writers and game developers and players and and I think now scholars as well, is that when you take a story into the form of a game, you're potentially changing the nature of what a story is. So when we shift between mediums, that's not just a jump to different platforms. You're not just experiencing the same thing, but on a different size screen. Right. So different mediums would an example be like a physical analog board game versus a digital one? Uh, so I was thinking that... more in terms of, so if you take a story and you have it in a TV format, or you have it mm. on a, in a movie. Okay. It's not just that you, you say, okay, well, let me just take that movie and then just chop up that story and put it in a game on a different size screen. It's more that when you take a story and put it into a game, you're potentially changing the fundamental nature of what a story is. Mm. Okay. So because players have agency, they're able to do stuff, they are in some considerable ways potentially making the story. So that's not really storytelling at all anymore. That's story making. Got it. So the that's players are now story makers. Potentially, yes. Uh, yeah. So instead of conceiving of a, a writer as being someone who tells the audience precisely what is happening and precisely the sequence within which that should happen, mm -hmm. you can now think of it in the context of games as a writer being someone who invests a world with story potential and then unleashes a player to construct or reconstruct a story out of that story potential. I'd imagine that when people think of a board game, they think, well, 
the video game industry is this huge, you know, I think it's like a $167 billion industry or something like that. It's huge. And I could imagine some people would think, well, now video games are, are overshadowing board mm -hmm. games and board games are, you know, waving goodbye and that's it, that we're not going to see them anymore. Do you agree with that kind of stance or do you see it from a different perspective? Short answer is I disagree. The, the longer <laughs> answer is the board game industry is probably worth about $3 billion, uh, annually right now. Uh, so clearly there's a massive disparity, right? Mm -hmm. But those figures on their own don't tell us there's lots that they don't tell us. They don't tell us how time works. So if you buy a $70 board game and you play with four other friends who didn't spend any money on that game and you all play for 150 hours each, mm. that's not showing up in those, in those figures. Also, the board game industry is growing it by about 15 to 20% each year, which is substantially more than probably what the, the video game industry is. So the growth, the growth rate is at a much faster pace for board games. Why yeah. do you think that is? Um, I think it's connected in, in some ways to the very fact that board games and video games are not opposing poles, they're connected. The, the, the rise, the resurgence in, in board games. There was a time in which board games, it absolutely looked that way, that board games were going to become obsolete in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. Mm. People started to feel that's what was happening. But I think the resurgence of board games is in part, a large part, down to the ubiquity of digital technology. People want to escape from their screens. I they think we want especially to... feel that way right now with COVID and everyone working from home. I can just imagine. Well, here's the thing, though, that, that digital technology is also facilitating people to play board games remotely. Interesting. So these things are not, they're not opposed. You know, there's plenty of people who play, um, who play both. I suspect most people who play games absolutely do, do play both. And we also have these hybrid games, which are blending digital technology with analog technology, right. which is a recent trend. When I think of like some very typical video games, and even there are a lot of board games that deal with the theme of war. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you think of like Call of Duty, for instance, is a great example. You know, I can't help but think of that in relation to the recent events that have unfolded in Afghanistan. Um, and I, I wonder from your perspective, Maurice, um, do you think that, that sometimes video games or analog board games or whatever format may risk trivializing the suffering and death that often comes with real war. Yeah, for sure. I mean, board, board games, video games can and frequently do trivialize war. But then I think movies and TV and fiction frequently does too. That doesn't mean they necessarily have to. It just depends on what your approach is. So, you know, we have in movies, we have Apocalypse Now, we have Band of Brothers on TV, we have Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. In, in fiction or you know swap those out for other examples that you you prefer but in video games we have spec ops the line we have games that actually don't just trivialize war; well, they come at it a, a different way and if we don't think about games as purely being driven by twitch gameplay by dexterity testing our ability to run and jump and and shoot and, and duck and so on then we can think about games that look at broader aspects of war things like strategy or politics or economy mm -hmm. Or, or even diplomacy, possibly. Yeah, absolutely, diplomacy. And, and board games in particular, I would say, that, although not exclusively, generally do a better job of that yeah. than, than video games. There's a whole sector of the board games uh, industry that, that looks at those kinds of aspects. If you want to understand Afghanistan or the war on terror, uh, you're going to do much better by looking at something like Labyrinth or uh, Distant Plane by Volker Runke, a former CIA analyst. You're going to get much closer looking at those kinds of analog games than you are by looking at a host of other right. video games that are essentially about shooting. Right. So we can actually learn how to think about things in more nuanced and bigger picture ways, including like issues like war, by playing some of these games, which is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. It's that, that experiential quality changes the, the nature of what uh, story is and your nature of... Your, the depth of your understanding are altered by the fact that you experience it. Oh, that's amazing. I want to go and check out all these new games and new ideas that you've shared with us, Maurice. Thank you so much for being on AHA. It was such a pleasure to have you. You're welcome. Thank you.